Just a couple announcements. Deacon's meeting on June 25th, and the Lord's Supper is on the same day, so uh, we'll be doing that. And also, you can see the VBS is in the bulletin again, and that's uh, very intentional. Uh, <laughs> We, I know these ladies have been doing a lot of work and planning, and men too, so uh, there's a lot behind it. And I just want you to keep it in prayer because uh, we just want to keep the, the nerves uh, to a minimum and let the Lord guide and lead and uh, be glorified. And I think that's the main point of VBSS is to let the kids have fun at the same time glorify God and have them learn something. So um, just continue to pray for it. And, go from there. So, um, and I think that's all I have. We'll dismiss the children. And you can see we're in moving on to spirituality. Spirituality. Number one and number two. <clears throat> And before we get going, let's take a minute of um, prayer. And for us, we usually like to uh, acknowledge our sins before God, not before me, not before your neighbor. It's none of their business. It's strictly God's business. And His Word tells us that if we confess our sins privately to Him, He is then faithful and just to forgive us those sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So we need that cleansing daily, um, and then we can grow spiritually as a result. So let's go ahead and take advantage of that, and then I'll pray and we'll get going. Let's pray. Dear Father, thank you so much for this, uh, this day and this, your word. Uh, we know that every day is very well uh, thought out by you and pre-planned. And we just want to continue on down this road to grow uh, in grace and knowledge of you. And we just uh, thank you for everything we ask today that we can concentrate in a way that is meaningful and where we can live this out in our daily lives. We thank you so much. And we ask these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen. So here we are. Congratulations. You've made it to, I think, the last segment of our belief system. And what I've done for these spirituality is this is actually the last two points in the doctrinal statement. But I've, I just combined them into uh, all spirituality because they both fall under the same category. So we'll go through number, I think it's 16 and 17, and that'll finish us off on this. But um, I guess we can start by reading um, the doctrinal statement and just seeing what it says, since this is what we'll be talking about. This is number 16. It says, we believe that spirituality is an absolute condition in the life of every believer in this age, wherein he is controlled by or filled with the Holy Spirit, walking in love and fellowship with the Lord Jesus Christ. Number 17, we believe that spirituality is distinct from maturity, that a believer becomes carnal through any uh, of mental, verbal, or overt sin, that spirituality and fellowship with Christ is restored solely by confession of sin to God. And there's your scripture references. Uh, there's quite a few of them. And these references actually go with both of these uh, um, bullets or points, you could say, uh, because I went through them and, and looked at them. And I won't be covering all of them, but I will be talking about some of them that are pertinent to us. And I think um, that we just need to bring out and see what they, what they talk about. So um, good stuff. But I wanted you to kind of start from the top, and we'll just work our way through this and just see where this goes. So the first one is spirituality is an absolute condition. And you know, that may sound maybe unusual, but it's really not too hard to understand when you, when you think about it. And then you can see this second point here, spirituality is distinct from maturity. And the idea there is that believers in Jesus Christ, we are spiritual. And at the same time, we do grow. But we're saying that spirituality is a 
uh, an absolute state that you are in or you are not in based on sins in your life or the filling of the Holy Spirit versus growth, which is a progressive growth pattern, just like any uh, degree that you obtain. It's a, pro it's a progressive, right? We have to learn. We have to grow. We have to get to a certain point in our life that God is trying to get us to. So that happens throughout your life. Spirituality, um, we're either in or out. And, and that's important each and every day, right? That we're either in uh, the filling of the Spirit or we're out, we're not filled with the Spirit. And it all boils down to really uh, the sin nature. And so let's look about, let's see kind of what this means and how it relates. Y'all see that message? Okay, there we go. Um, and I think the best way to think about this is to look at scriptures or at least look at some of the meanings behind what the Holy Spirit does. And the easiest way to see that is to uh, look at the ministries of the Holy Spirit, right? You've seen these before. Uh, these are the main ones there that the Holy Spirit does. He regenerates you. Uh, at the moment uh, you believe in Jesus Christ, guess what? You're a new creature. You're born again. Uh, you're regenerated, right? You're a child of God at that point. He baptizes you. You're baptized into uh, the body of Christ, of believers. You have a new identification. He indwells you. That's a permanent thing. He seals you. Sealing is a great doctrine because it shows your eternal security. And it shows that once you're sealed, no one can ever remove that seal, even yourself. And then He fills you. And what we're saying is that these first four are different from the last one. We're saying that spirituality is an absolute condition because of the temporariness of the last, the filling, right? And, and how can I say that? Well, I can say that because the last one is the only one that we're commanded to be. Be filled with the Spirit. The other, the first four automatically happen at the point you are saved. So those were never, Scripture never commands us to be regenerated, baptized, and dwelled, or sealed after the point you're saved, because those things are automatically applied, and you never lose those. The only one you can lose is the filling of the Holy Spirit. So you see, this is more of a day-to-day -day thing, the filling, right? So when we talk about spirituality, I know we use that word in a lot of different ways, and that's fine. But the way we're talking about it here in the doctrinal statement, we're talking about being filled or not being filled with the Spirit. So if you're going to be a spiritual person, guess what? You need to be filled, obviously, with the Spirit. It has the word Spirit in it, right? Spiritual. So um, obviously these are good things to know because when we don't understand this, we can't live the spiritual life as God has designed it to be. If we're not sure about an absolute state, if we're in or we're out, we're just living, right? We're, we're not sure. So, so this last one is different. And as you know, it's something that you can lose because of our sin natures. And when, you, when I think about living the, the Christian way of life or living the spiritual life, as we sometimes call it, um, the only thing that interrupts that living is sin. That's, that's the one thing that interrupts living the, the way God wants us to live. It's sin. So, so this is the one that kind of like we're mostly talking about when we talk about spirituality. Because you, you can't lose the first four, but you can lose, at least temporarily, right? However long you want to lose it, however long you uh, choose to be in that sinful state, I guess you could say. Um, so, and this is the one, that's why God commands us to be filled with the Spirit. So where's the command? <coughs> the command is in Ephesians 518. Let's read this. I want you to see a little bit of the context here just to show you. So I backed up a few verses here. And here's verse 15. It says, therefore, be careful how you walk. Now keep that word in mind, walk. 
because that's a big, uh, a big topic when we're talking about spirituality. Because remember, this is day-to-day -day walking. This is your Christian life. This is your, your, you know, this is your interaction with people. This is how we think. This is walking, right? Be careful how you walk, not as unwise men, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. So then, do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. And then here's verse 18, and here's the command. After all, those, all that context, do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. And I think it's good because a lot of times we just read verse 18. And, you know, and that's okay, but it's sometimes good to back up and read because it gives you more insight of why that command is even there. Well, we can clearly see why it's there when we know we have to be careful. We know we have to be wise. We know we, we're not supposed to be foolish. And we have to understand what the will of the Lord is. All those things are coming into play with the command to be filled with the Spirit. So you can see how important it is after you back up and say, okay, wow, I've got to do all these things. No wonder I have to be filled. Because that's required in order to be careful in your walk. If you're going to have any kind of uh, sensitivity, awareness, carefulness, you've got to be filled with the Spirit on a consistent basis to even be careful, right? That's part of the, these things all kind of go together. So, um, and this word walk, it's referring to your conduct in making daily decisions either for God or against Him. In a very basic sense, that's what the word means. Uh, you know, we could boil that down, okay, I made this decision, I made that decision. Yes. Collectively, though, that's your walk. What kind of decisions did you make? Th that's your walk, right? Were they good? Were they bad? Were they for pro-God, against God? Were they in God's plan for your life, or were you out at that point? So were you filled with the Spirit, or were you not, right? So, and, and this is why we have the command to be careful. Because you know, in the day-to-day -day walk, we can stumble so easily. It's so easy to make a bad decision, right? We can be learning and growing, everything's clicking along, and all of a sudden we get hit by, you know, some test that God throws at us. Or some, you know, some, that sinful nature just reaches and grabs us and, and pulls us down, and we just succumb to it. And all of a sudden, now we're in another predicament that we weren't in the day before. So being careful is a day-to-day -day thing, definitely being careful. We have to focus on how we live, right? You have to focus on how you live. If you don't focus on how you think and how you live and how you interact, what you say, what you do, all those things, then we can't live the Christian way of life because it requires us to be careful. It really does. Just for the simple reason that you have a sin nature, as we all do, we're all born with a sin nature. We can't do anything with that sin nature except live with it. <laughs> Thank God He's given us a, a way to live with that sin nature and still glorify Him in a sinful body. It's amazing, but He has given us that ability, and that has to do with the filling of the Spirit. So, so we do need to be careful about how we walk. And you know the, the negative effects when we're not careful or we get involved further into some kind of sin, whatever it may be. Everybody has their own weaknesses, their strengths when it comes to sin. Your sins may be different from their sins, right? And, and we're human beings and we gravitate to different areas. But the reality is God has given us the power to overcome those sins. I'm not saying you're going to completely eradicate sin out of your life, but I will say you will sin less. And you can be on a consistent path of growth in your life and glorify God in a consistent way, and that's encouraging. Instead of keep falling to sin, succumbing to sin, and you know, there's no happiness in that. You feel like you're getting up every time, you're dusting yourself off, and you have to start over and over every time. But at least when you continue in a plan that is in God's plan and, and filled with, guided with, with the Spirit, guess what? You can begin to see that you're growing to a different level 
on a daily basis, I would say, if you're, if you're growing on that, on that level. So, um, and then you see this, and that's why Paul says this next. Well, after that. That's why we have to be careful, because look what we have to do. We have to be wise. He says, don't walk as unwise men, but wise men. And when I, the first thing I think about when I think of being wise is I think of wisdom. God's Word. If we're going to walk, if we're going to have any kind of, uh, you know, cautiousness about the way we walk, we have to have the wisdom to see what's wrong. We have to have the wisdom to see if what we're doing is even right or if it's even something to be concerned about or if you need to make a course change in your life. If you don't have the wisdom to see that, you're not going to make that change. You're not going to make that course change because you will not have the discernment to see that, okay, this is something I need to fix. It'll just be there and you'll just be dealing with it, but in all the wrong ways that aren't a fix or a solution to that problem. And that's just the normal way of life nowadays in, our, in, in this world, right? Temporary solutions, but you can see what it says, not as unwise, but as wise, making the most of your time because the days are evil. That applies. It applied then. And it applies today. This is over 2,000 years ago. It applies today just as much as it did then, just as much as it will in the future, just as much as it did after Adam and Eve sinned. The days are evil. Once sin was introduced into the world, evil was also introduced into the world, at least as far as the human race was concerned. Satan already had his part as far as evil and sin was concerned. I'm talking about us, the people. So you can really understand, yes, the days are evil because we live in an evil day. And another key part of this is making the most of your time. We don't think about that because we, you know, day-to-day -day living, we get, you know, this is just kind of monotonous and this is what I have to do. I'm growing. You know, nothing really seems to be going the way I want it to go. So you lose track of time. But this says making the most of your time. And actually the Greek word indicates that you're buying something back. You're redeeming the time. In other words, you're not losing out, you're not missing out on the day. You're not missing out on the time that you're taking advantage of right now. You're buying it back. This is time that is bought back right here. I can at least say that for the most of us. We're buying back this time. It's not going to waste. But really the waste comes in when we walk out the doors. That's what this is talking about, walking. You're sitting right now. We're talking about walking, living. Just joking. But you're, we're talking about day-to-day -day walking and living, right? So if we're going to be wise and make the most of our time, we need to do that. And you see what it's boiling down to? It's boiling down to being spiritual. Being spiritual. Being filled with the Spirit. The command is, is leading us to that direction, right? So, and then you have verse 17, verse 17, so then do not be foolish, but understand what the will of the Lord is. You see the so then right here. It's telling us the means or the manner by which we will be able to be careful. Right here. This is how we're going to be able to do that. Do not be foolish and understand what the will of the Lord is. That's how you're going to be able to be careful and make the most of your time. Because if you understand God's instructions on how to live, that's the best you can be. And especially if you carry that out, right? You're making the most of your time because you've taken the time to not only learn it, but you're taking the time to, to put it into practice in your walk. And, and that's what this is referring to when it says do not be foolish because I'll tell you what, we have a bunch of foolish Christians today who don't understand the will of the Lord. Because the word foolish means just means ignorant. It just means to not know something. And, and that's all it means. And Satan loves for Christians to not know the will of God. He loves them to go to church. He loves them to hang out with Christian friends. But along with that, he loves that they don't know the will of the Lord, the will of God. And that's a, the, the biggest part. See how we, he's disconnected knowing and understanding from just acting out the Christian life? 
to just appearing like a Christian, learning something maybe that's motivational, it sounds good. There's a bunch of people, there's a bunch of social things there, there's a lot of things that I like, a lot of my age group there, there's all these things are there, A, B, C, D, on my list. But understanding the will of the Lord is way on the bottom. It's way on the bottom. That's where we're at. That's where we're at. That's why it says do not be ignorant. Don't be ignorant. That should be the message for America. Don't be ignorant. We need to understand what the will of the Lord is. That's part of all of this. I'm not up here for anything but for us to understand the will of the Lord. That's the purpose of this church, to understand what God desires. I mean, that, that's huge. But Satan is very good, and he knows what he's doing. He knows we have a sin nature, and he's distracted a lot of people. Because, you know what? There's a lot to be distracted by. I get it, right? I get it. I enjoy that stuff too, just as much as you do, just as much as the next person do. I enjoy the same age groups. I enjoy music. I enjoy a basketball game. I enjoy bass. I enjoy all these events that happen at churches. But when you take out understanding the will of the Lord, I'm out. I'm out. That's where I have to tap out, and that's where every Christian should tap out. When you're losing sight of understanding what God wants from us as believers, you've been blinded. You've been blinded. So that's why it says do not be foolish. So we can't be, we can't be ignorant. We have to understand. And what ignorance means in this context is just lacking the knowledge. It's not being offensive. It's just saying you don't have what you need to have in your soul. You're lacking the information. So, and I think you very well understand that we, in our culture and our society today, so the most important thing has been put to the back of the line here. So, and by the way, all these underlying words in here are commands. That's a lot of commands. That's a lot of commands in this verse. Let's see, one, two, three, four, five. Five in, what is that, four verses? There's five commands right there. All telling us of things that we are to do. Remember when God gives us a command, He's like, do this. I'm not just saying as a suggestion, I'm saying it for your own benefit. In other words, carry it out, right? So, and then look at verse 18. It says, and do not get drunk with wine, for that is dissipation, but be filled with the Spirit. <laughs> Remember, Paul is talking about being careful in your Christian walk. Remember that. Keep that in mind. He's talking about not wasting time. He's also talking about um, being wise because the days are evil, right? And he uses one sin of drunkenness. Why didn't he use any other sin? This is a sin. We know that a, a sin is a sin, but he used one sin, drunkenness, and he did it for a very specific reason. Because guess what? Drunkenness is a sin you can't just confess and you're, you're done. When you're drunk, you're drunk. If you're in sin when you're drunk, you can't confess because you're still drunk once you've confessed that sin. So that means you're still influenced by the alcohol, and the Holy Spirit cannot touch you, at least until you're out of that sin. You see the controlling effect that alcohol has? This is the only sin that Paul can mention besides some type of drug that has that controlling influence over you for an extended period of time. Your incarnality, we could say, are out of fellowship, right? So do not get drunk with wine, for that is what? It's a waste of time. That's what the word means. It's a waste of time. Dissipation, it means you look back on those times where you were controlled or under the influence of whatever it may be. It could be any sin. Out of fellowship, this is just using one sin in particular. Whatever your sin of choice is, I don't know. But Paul's saying, look back on that time you were out of fellowship and look how that time was just wasted. Wasted. We say, oh yeah, that was sure fun, I had a good time. 
We're talking about divine waste, though. I'm talking about eternal value versus temporary fleeting value in this life. That's what this is talking about. So there's a lot of good times to be had, but guess what? You have to die and go to heaven at some point. You have to bring something with you if you want to at least be distinguished from the rest of the crowd, right? I'm not saying you're not saved. What I'm saying is that God gives you an opportunity to do something here for there. And, and not to mention, guess what? You get to enjoy those things here, those blessings here. So there is a distinguish to be made. But the reality is that Paul is pointing this out because it is a controlling sin. It's a controlling sin. And once it controls you, you are influenced by that sin. You're guided by that sin. Your thinking is based off that sin. Your actions are based off that sin. Hey, that's a lot. Well, wait a minute. That's what the Holy Spirit does. He guides. He empowers. He allows you to think properly, to make decisions based on Him. He controls the soul. That's what the filling of the Holy Spirit does. Paul's pointing out a sin that does that, but in the carnal state. <laughs> Isn't that crazy? But it's true. And any sin can do that, by the way. This is just one that has a little bit different effects than just gossip and confession. Right? You can get out of that pretty quick. Or I guess you don't have to. But you can't get out of this one. So, I think it fits perfectly, but so many people take this to say, oh, well, just don't do this and you're fine. No, sin is sin. Sin is sin. Paul's just pointing one out because it's very effective in his teaching method, the way he's teaching us, the way he's showing us what we need to see in this, in this context. So, don't waste the time. And then there's a contrast. You see the bottom, the contrast, but? So all this, instead of not being careful, being unwise, not making the most of your time, being ignorant, letting sin control your life through whatever it is, instead of those things, be filled with the Spirit. That's the contrast. That's the contrast this is, at least this context is talking about here. So if we carry out this command, it means you what? It means you're careful in your walk. It means you're living wisely. It means you're not letting sin control your life. You see how all these things are flipped? It means you're making the most of your time. Filling of the Spirit controls everything. It guides, it controls, it influences. That's why the English uh, word is filled. You know, don't think about, uh, you know, the Kool-Aid man filling up somebody's body. Think of an all-encompassing influence upon your soul. And that means that you are fully, not only divine driven, but you're on God's plan and God's will, and you're not wasting the time. Because you're thinking according to God's plan, according to God's way, and most importantly, according to God's motivation. If you're rightly motivated to do something through the Holy Spirit, guess what? It's going to be right. It's going to be right. God is going to approve whatever you do, whatever it may be. It's going to be divine good. That has eternal value. I don't care if it's giving somebody a pencil. Here, take it, it's yours. If you're rightly motivated, that counts. That counts as something that is, can be a blessing in your life and theirs, right? So, so we can see just from this verse that we do have a command here to be filled, and that filling is directly related to sin, to sin, which means there's something we have to do, and there's something we have to not do as it relates to filling of the Holy Spirit. What you will notice as we look at this study is that when we're talking about the filling of the Holy Spirit, when we're talking about walking in the Spirit, when we're talking about fellowship, when we're talking about all these things, a lot of times what you find in the context around these verses is sin. That's not an accident. That's not an I have to put two and two together as a pastor. If sin isn't included in verse 15, but it is in verse 18, that means it's included. Because in the context, we're talking. this is a story. 
God doesn't exclude one verse and say, hey, teach about this one and not this one. He says you've got to talk about these, right? So sin affects the filling of the Holy Spirit because this is a controlling aspect. This is something about control. Either sin controls us or absolute condition or the Holy Spirit controls us. There can only be two controlling aspects in your life and there can't be anywhere in between. So part of understanding spirituality is understanding that you can't be 50% spiritual. You can't be 10% spiritual. You're either 100% or you're 0%. That's the best way to understand it. See how it's different from maturity or growth, spiritual growth? You can be a 10% Christian because you just believe you're growing. You can be a 50%. You can, well, we can't ever be 100%. But you get the idea. You can grow, and that has progress. There is value that can be assigned to your growth. But spirituality is a little bit different. It's either light on, light off, right? There's a pattern there, and it has to do with sin in your life. So, and guess what? Because it's a command, as you know, God gives us commands. Why? Because we have to do something. We have to do something. That's the whole reason God gives commands. If, if we want to just sit and learn, that's great. But at the end of the day, you're going to have to, I'm not even talking about physically doing something. I'm talking about in your mind, you have to make a decision to make a change. And this specific change here is, well, there's a lot of changes. There's a lot of changes, really. But we're talking about being filled with the Spirit. So in my mind, that means we have to do something. And either you are not filled or you are filled based on you following this command. So that's why the filling is different in a way from all the other ministries of the Holy Spirit. Because it's the only one that we're commanded to do after salvation. And that's how we can say it's absolute, right? Because either you are or you're not. Um, so don't think that it's automatic, all I wanted to tell you on that. So many Christians think I'm a believer, so I'm filled all the time. You wouldn't be, or you wouldn't have the command to be filled if you were filled all the time. God doesn't work like that. He doesn't tell you to do something and you already have it, and you always do it. That's not how God works. He gives us a command because we're capable of not carrying out the command. <laughs> so, so there's something we have to do and not do. Keep that in mind. And it's not automatic, and it's not something that you have permanently. It's something that you have to stay on top of. That's what we're, where we're going. It's something that you have to stay on top of. And if we've got to stay on top of it, that just further emphasizes the absoluteness of it. If either we are or we aren't, and that's something we have to stay on top of, guess what? We want to be, it's something we are. We want to be filled always or as much as we can, right? Which also means because the Christian walk has everything to do with being filled with the Spirit. Everything. Your walk as a Christian has everything to do with being filled with the Spirit. Are you aware of that? Well, you are now. Because it does. Because there's two motivations. There's two ways of doing business. There's two powers. One's mine. One's the Holy Spirit's. There's two wills. One's mine. One's God's. You see the difference? Holy Spirit's God. Trinity's God. If, if you're motivated by the Holy Spirit, guess what? You're on God's time. You're on God's motivation. You're on God's will for your life. That's how big of a deal this is. Don't exclude the Holy Spirit and say, Father, Son, Holy Spirit, oh, he, he sits over here because he's different. All God, one God, three in person, one God. So, important concept, but you can begin to see why spirituality is such an important thing and why it's an absolute condition because either you are or you're not based on what? Sin. Sin. That's what... That's what rattles that relationship. I'm not saying your position. Don't, don't get this confused with your position in Christ. I'm talking about your fellowship here, your position, your participation in the plan of God. 
Sin is what uh, allows that to fluctuate. And guess what? God doesn't want that to fluctuate. We're the ones that are making a decision to sin. No one makes a sin. I'm, I'm speaking to the choir. No one makes a sin. We make the choice to get out of the filling or to be filled, right? That's all a decision-making process that we have to go through. So here's this word to be filled in that verse. It's plerao. It's a good word. It means to make full, to fill, to occupy the space in full. And the example given is, is sound in a room, right? Nothing can escape the sound, at least in this room, maybe in the kids' room you can, but even the, um, what do you call those things that we see sometimes in here running around in the books? Little bugs. Silverfish. I lost it. I think we killed them all. They'll be back. They do like our, our hymnals. Um, even the silverfish can hear what's going on if they have, if, if they have ears, right? If they, can, if they can hear. They don't have ears. But you get the idea. Sound travels and it, and it fills the room. It fills the entire room because nothing can escape the sound. That's what this is referring to when we're talking about filling, the filling of the Holy Spirit. Your soul is completely guided, influenced, empowered, taken over by the Holy Spirit when you allow Him to take it over. See, that, that, that's how much the filling is, that's pervasive, right? It completely consumes you. It can also mean to take full possession of, which fully fits here. When we think about being filled with the Spirit, you are being taken possession of by the Holy Spirit. Don't think about it, you know, you're some kind of possessed person that's doing something you're not supposed to do. I'm not talking about that. I'm talking about the Holy Spirit is possessing you, which means you have help now. You have the guidance you need. You have the wisdom. That's what the verse is leading up to. You have the wisdom, the, the discernment, the, the, what you need to think with to be able to make the right decisions. That's a big deal in the Christian life, right? It's not something that we can do on our own. We need help. And thank God He sent us help. He's given us help. The Holy Spirit is definitely our help. Remember the paraclete? The paracletos? The helper. Um, and and this, this fits well here. The full possession of. When you're filled, we are occupied by him. And guess what? You're also walking in the spirit. Walking in the spirit. Those two things are not unrelated. If you're filled, you have no choice but to be walking in the spirit. Because if you're fully influenced by the Spirit, you're walking by the Spirit's power. That's what the Scripture is talking about when it says walking by the Spirit. That requires the filling of the Spirit. And, and remember, we're seeing this word walk. We've seen it once and we're going to see it again. I'm just telling you now because it's going to keep coming up. Because walking is different from your position in Christ. It's experiential. It's something that goes up. It's something that goes down. It's something that you don't always stay consistent with in your, in your Christian life. That's how we can say it's absolute. Because sometimes you're, you're filled and sometimes you're not. Sometimes you're making right decisions. Sometimes you're sinning. You can't claim spirituality when you're in a state of sin. I'm sorry. Can't do it. As, mu as bad as we would say, like to say, you know what, I did that sin, but guess what? God gave us a way to deal with that sin. Confession, right? As we'll see later. Uh, this verb is also sometimes used when talking about filling someone with powers or qualities. That's huge. If you're going to do anything in this life, any kind of ministry, any kind of thing in God's plan, you can't do it in your own strength. I'm not up here by my own power. If I was, I wouldn't be here. 
Because God is the one who gives me the strength, who gives me what I need, who gives me the content of the notes, who gives me the information in my brain, and who allows me to speak it to you. This is, this is God-driven. Every ministry should be driven by God. Specifically right here, we're talking about the Holy Spirit. If it's not driven by the Holy Spirit, what is it? Is it even a ministry? Well, there's a lot of ministries that are just human driven, driven by human power. And all of a sudden, what do you have? Is you have a ministry that is motivated by a human being. And that's trouble because guess what we are? We're sinful people. And all we have to bring to the table is what I want for my gain. That's not a good ministry. All of a sudden now you want money. Right? That's a big one. That's a big ministry nowadays. There's a ministry that's not based on the Holy Spirit. You want a lot of power. You want a lot of wealth. You want a lot of people inside the doors. That's a human ministry. Those things can be great when they're taken in the right context. If God wants to give you those things, outstanding. But if you're doing it out of your own personal motivation, it's wrong. It's wrong. It's got to be motivated by God. So, so when you're fully occupied or influenced, guess what? Your thoughts are controlled by the Holy Spirit. You have right motivation and you have right action. And those things count. We want to look back on our time and say, I didn't waste time because all those things checked and were in place. I had right decisions. I was rightly motivated. I had right decisions and I had right actions. That's what we want to check the, check the boxes on. Um, so, present tense here, you see the P-R-E-S. That means all the time. The command is telling you to be, to be filled all the time. And the reality is you can't do that, but it doesn't lessen the present tense. God still requires that of us all 100% of the time. That's the command. I, I, you know, God doesn't say, okay, you can sin just for a little bit because you have a sin nature and get away with it. He says, I want you to be filled all the time. Even though it's impossible, we're still required to be in this state. Right? There, there is no excuse for a sin. I'm not saying you, you won't commit a sin. There's, there's still, even though you have sin, there's no excuse to commit a sin. That's one way to say it. And you will sin. Just a matter of how much in the believer's life. That's the issue, right? And how quickly you recover from that sin. How quickly you move past. How quickly you confess. Time is of the essence when it comes to sin. Because do you realize when I don't confess, when I'm not filled, dissipation, that meter is growing the wasted time is growing. I'm figuring out how to deal with that sin over here. You could have been long gone past whatever you did, feeling sorry for yourself now. Now you're depressed. Now you're into something else. Now you've gone off. And you see how many directions you can go? Instead of letting God deal with that sin, he died on the cross for every sin, no matter how bad it was. That's what allows you to move forward in the Christian life is it's all rooted in forgiveness. Forgiveness. Think about the, the worst thing that was ever done to you in your entire life and you could never get over it. Well, that was forgiven too. And we should actually forgive those things as well. Christ forgave you, so you should forgive others. That's what the verse says, doesn't it? So, present tense means all the time. Imperative mood, you know what that means. IMP, command. Passive voice, this is interesting. It's saying that you receive the action of the being filled. You receive the action of the verb. It's something that you don't come up with on your own. It's something that you receive from God. He gives it to you. He gives it to you. And that makes sense because this isn't something we can conjure up on our own. You know, I can't go in a room and, and, and do something and say, okay, I got the Holy Spirit now, right? This is something that's God-given. 
That's why it's passive voice. It's from Him. He's given it to us. That makes perfect sense. But at the same time, you're responsible to be filled. Don't get confused. God gives, but you're responsible for taking action in, up here to do so, right? So to be a spiritual Christian means to be filled with the Holy Spirit, which obviously can't be measured in degrees, right? 100% or zero. So, um, and I think that's a good, good place to stop, and we'll just pick back up with this um, when we come back. Let's take a break. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, thank you so much for your grace and uh, your wisdom. And we just uh, want to continually pray that uh, the VBS goes well and that you guide it and you uh, conduct it in a way that is glorifying to you. We just pray that these kids can um, uh, just learn and grow and uh, of course most importantly uh, accept Jesus Christ as their personal Lord and Savior and we just ask that um, all this goes according to your plan and that uh, we do it as unto the Lord we thank you so much for everything that you do and most importantly we thank you for Jesus Christ who gave us the salvation who gave us and died for our sins on the cross and gave us that as a free gift. Your word tells us if we believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, we will be saved. That's it. That's the free grace gift that we've been given, and we're so grateful for it. We ask all these things in Jesus Christ's name. Amen.